Good evening and welcome to Postmark Films Works series, Our Bridges, Stories from When. I'm Deborah Catherine, a Campbell County artist and board member of Postmark. Our format for this series begins with a short reading from literature. Tonight's selection is from Sketches of Bird Life, copyrighted in 1871 by the author John Burroughs himself, and again in 1911 by Houghton Mifflin Company. Burroughs was born April 3, 1837, and he lived until March 29, 1921. He was an American naturalist and nature essayist who was very active in the conservation movement. He was the seventh of 10 children born on a family farm in the lower Catskill Mountains. He worked on the family farm and loved the return of the birds each spring and other wildlife around the family farm. As a teenager, Burroughs showed great interest in learning, but his father refused to provide money for books and a higher education, as the father believed that a basic education was enough. Burroughs left home at 17 years old and worked his way through school by teaching. He spent time in Alaska. He traveled with Theodore Roosevelt, John Muir, Henry Ford, and Thomas Edison, camping in the woods and sleeping in tents, and spent a lot of time in the Alleghenies and the Adirondacks. He wrote about birds, flowers, and rural life for popular magazines and commented on the view from the top of a mountain. The works of man dwindle, and the original features of the huge globe come out. You discover with a feeling of surprise that the great thing is the earth itself, which stretches away on every hand so far beyond your ken. In 1874, he bought a farm and grew crops, including grapes, and continued to write and work as a federal bank examiner for several more years. Let us begin. Bird stories from the burrows. The bluebird. 
It is sure to be a bright March morning when you first hear the bluebird's noise. So tender is it, and so prophetic, a hope tinged with a regret. There never was a happier or more devoted husband than the male bluebird. He's the champion and escort of the female at all times. And while she is sitting, he feeds her regularly. It is very pretty to watch them building their nest. The male is very active in hunting out a place and exploring the boxes and cavities, but seems to have no choice in the matter and is anxious only to please and encourage his mate, who has the practical turn and knows what will do and what will not. After she has suited herself, he applauds her immensely, and away the two go in quest of material for the nest, the male acting as guard and flying above and in advance of the female. She brings all the material and does all the work of building, he looking on and encouraging her with gesture and song. He acts as inspector of her work, but I fear is a very partial one. She enters the nest with her bit of dry grass or straw and having adjusted it to her notion, withdraws and waits nearby while he goes in and looks it over. On coming out, he exclaims very plainly, excellent, excellent and the way the two go again for more material. I was much amused one summer day in seeing a bluebird feeding her young one. She had captured a cicada or harvest fly and after bruising it a while on the ground, flew with it to a tree and placed it in the beak of a young bird. It was a large morsel and the mother seemed to have doubts of her chick's ability to dispose of it for she stood near and watched its efforts with great solicitude. The young bird struggled valiantly with the cicada, but made no headway in swallowing it, when the mother took it from him and flew to the walk and proceeded to break and bruise it more thoroughly. Then she again placed it in his beak and seemed to say, There, try it now, and sympathized so thoroughly with his efforts that she repeated many of his motions and contortions. But the great fly was unyielding and indeed seemed ridiculously disproportioned to the beak that held it. The young bird fluttered and fluttered and screamed, I'm stuck! I'm stuck! Till the anxious parent again seized the morsel and carried it to an iron railing where she came down upon it for the space of a minute with all the force and momentum her beak could command. Then she offered it to her young a third time, but with the same result as before, except that this time the bird dropped it. But she reached the ground as soon as the cicada did and taking it in her beak, flew a little distance to a high board fence where she sat motionless for some moments. The male bluebird approached her and said very plainly, and, and I thought rather curtly, give me that bug. But she quickly resented his interference and flew further away, where she sat apparently quite discouraged when I last saw her. One day in early May, I made an expedition to a still, dark, deep stream on the alert for any bit of wildlife of bird or beast that might turn up. There were so many abandoned woodpecker chambers in the small dead trees as we went along that I determined to secure the section of a tree containing a good one to take home and put up for the bluebirds as bluebirds do not come so far into the woods as this. After carefully scrutinizing several of the trees, I at last saw one that seemed to fill the bill. After considerable effort, I succeeded in breaking the stub off near the ground and brought it down into the boat. Just the thing, I said. Surely the bluebirds will prefer this to an artificial box. But lo and behold, 
it already had bluebirds in it. I had not heard a sound or seen a feather till the trunk was in my hands, when, on peering into the cavity, I discovered two young bluebirds about half grown. This was a, a predicament indeed. Well, the only thing I could do was to stand the tree trunk up again as well as I could and as near as I could to where it had stood before. This was no easy thing, but after a time, I had it fairly well replaced. This left the hole to the nest about 10 feet below and to one side of its former position. Just then, I heard the voice of one of the parent birds and quickly paddled to the other side of the stream 50 feet away to watch her proceedings. The mother bird had a large beetle in her beak. She alighted upon a limb a few feet above the former side of her nest, looked down upon us, uttered a note or two, and then dropped down confidently to the point in the vacant air where the entrance to her nest had been but a few moments before. Here, she hovered on the wing a second or two, looking for something that was not there, and then returned to the perch she had just left. She hammered the beetle rather excitedly upon the limb a few times, then dropped down to try for her nest again. Only vacant air there. She hovers and hovers, her blue wings flickering in the checkered light. Surely that precious hole must be there. But no, again she's baffled. And again she returns to her perch and mauls the poor beetle till it must be reduced to a pulp. Then she makes a third attempt, then a fourth, and a fifth, and a sixth, till she becomes very much excited. What could have happened? Then she flies away through the woods, calling, calling, going for her mate, I said. She's in deep trouble, and she wants sympathy and help. In a few minutes, I heard her mate answer, and presently the two birds came hurrying to the spot, both with loaded beaks. They perched upon the familiar limb above the side of the nest, and the mate seemed to say, My dear, what has happened to you? I can find that nest. And he dived down and brought up in the empty air, just as the mother had done. His mate sat regarding him intently, confident, I think, that he would find the clue, but he did not. Baffled and excited, he returned to the perch beside her. Then she tried again. Then he rushed down once more. Then they both assaulted the place, but it would not give up its secret. They talked, they encouraged each other, and they kept up the search. Now one, now the other, now both together. Sometimes they dropped down to within a few feet of the entrance to the nest, and we thought they would surely find it. No, their minds and eyes were intent only upon that square foot of space where the nest had been. Soon they withdrew to a large limb, many feet higher up, and seemed to say to themselves, well, it is not there, but it must be here somewhere. Let us look about. A few minutes elapsed when we saw the mother bird spring from her perch and go straight as an arrow to the nest. Her maternal eye had proved the quicker. She had found her young. Something like reason and common sense had come to her rescue. She had taken time to look about, and behold, there was that precious doorway. She thrust her head into it, then sent back a call to her mate. Yes, it is true. They are here. They are here. Then she gave them the food in her beak, and then gave place to her mate, 
who, after similar demonstrations of joy, also gave them his morsel. I breathed freer. A burden had been taken from my mind and heart, and I went cheerfully on my way. I had learned something, too. I had learned that when in the deep woods you think of bluebirds, bluebirds may be nearer than you think. The robin. Not long after the bluebird comes the robin. In large numbers, they scour the fields and groves. You hear their piping in the meadow, in the pasture, on the hillside. Walk in the woods, and the dry leaves rustle with the whirr of their wings. The air is vocal with their cheery call. In excess of joy and of vastity, they run, leap, scream, chase each other through the air, diving and sweeping among the trees with perilous rapidity. In that free, fascinating, half-work and half-play pursuit, the robin is one's constant companion. When the day is sunny and the ground bare, you meet him at all points and hear him at all hours. And sitting thus amid the stark, silent trees, above the wet, cold earth, with the chill of the winter still in the air, there is no fitter or sweeter songster in the whole round year. The first utterance and the spell of winter is thoroughly broken and the remembrance of it afar off. In the latter half of April, we pass through what I call the robin racket, Trains of three or four birds rushing pell-mell over the lawn, all piping and screaming at the top of their voices. But whether in mirth or anger, it is hard to tell. The nucleus of the train is a female. One cannot see that the males in pursuit of her are rivals. It seems rather as if they had united to hustle her out of the place but somehow the matches are no doubt made and sealed during these mad rushes. Maybe the female shouts out to her suitors, who touches me first wins, and away she scurries like an arrow. The males shout out, agreed, and away they go in pursuit, each trying to outdo the other. The game is a brief one. Before one can get the clue to it, the party has dispersed. The cow blackbird is a noticeable songster in April, though it takes a back seat a little later. It utters a peculiarly liquid April sound. Indeed, one would think its crop was full of water, its notes so bubble up and are delivered with such an apparent stomach contraction. This bird is the only feathered polygamist we have. The females are greatly in excess of the males, and the latter are usually attended by three or four of the former. As soon as the other birds begin to build, they prowling about not to steal the young of others, but to steal their eggs into other birds' nests, and so shirk the labor and responsibility of hatching and rearing their own young. There's no doubt that in many cases, the cowbird makes room for her own egg in the nest by removing one of the bird's own. I found a sparrow's nest with two sparrow's eggs and one cowbird's egg, and another egg lying a foot or so below it on the ground. I replaced the ejected egg, and the next day found it again removed, and another cowbird's egg in its place. I put it back a second time, when it was again ejected or, or destroyed, for I failed to find it anywhere. Every cowbird is reared at the expense of two or more songbirds. For every one of these dusky little pedestrians, there amid the grazing cattle, there are two or more sparrows or vireos or warblers, the less. It is a big price to pay two larks for a bunting. 
but nature does not hesitate occasionally to contradict herself in just this way. The young of the cowbird is disproportionately large and aggressive. One might say hoggish. When disturbed, it will clasp the nest and scream and snap its beak threateningly. One was hatched out in a song sparrow's nest, which was under my observation, and would soon have overridden and overborne the young sparrow which came out of the shell a few hours later, had I not interfered from time to time and lent the young sparrow a helping hand. The Chipping Sparrow Last summer, I made this record in my notebook. A nest of young robins in the maple in front of the house being fed by a chipping sparrow. The little sparrow is very attentive, seems decidedly fond of her adopted babies. The old robins resent her services and hustle her out of the tree whenever they find her near the nest. It was this hurried departure of Chippy from the tree that first attracted my attention. She watches her chances and comes with food in their absence. The young birds are about ready to fly, and when the Chippy feeds them, her head fairly disappears in their capacious mouths. She jerks it back as if she were afraid of being swallowed. Then she lingers near them on the edge of the nest, and seems to admire them. When she sees the old robin coming, she spreads her wings in an attitude of defense and then flies away. A day later, the robins are out of the nest and the little sparrow continues to feed them. She approaches them rather timidly and hesitatingly, as if she feared they might swallow her, then thrusts her tidbit quickly into the distended mouth and jerks back. Whether the chippy had lost her own brood, whether she was an unmated bird, or whether the case was simply the overflowing of the maternal instinct, it would be interesting to know. My name is John Anderson, and uh, I lived in Virginia at the time of this birth study of Mary Badge I'm going to talk about. Uh, I was about 12 years old, and I, but I had to get the boys got Mary married badge, and I borrowed a pair of binoculars and got some uh, extra shoes and things. Uh, going through the underbrush and then went out to study birds. After that, I had to go back and, and write down the, the birds that I studied and, and did that uh, every, about every morning for quite, quite some time. Mm -hmm. I collected about, I don't know, 30 or more birds. Beyond that, became a kind of local authority on them. 